a way <coughs> uh, about quantum estimation theory and quantum metrology. <coughs> so what is quantum metrology? Basically, quantum metrology is uh, that uh, research sector of quantum information theory that deals with uh, um, how to use quantum effects like entanglement, like squeezing, uh, in order to improve your ability to probe uh, reality, basically. And as a matter of fact, quantum metrology consists in, uh, in several subsectors like uh, parameter estimation, uh, remote detection, uh, hypothesis testing, and so on and so forth. And I'm not sure I can cover all this uh, area, but I will just give you a generic overview on, on this field. So the how to look of my presentation is this one. So to begin with, I will start by briefly reviewing what a quantum measurement is. Okay, how do we formalize these processes in quantum mechanics? And then I will move, once we have set these, uh, these, uh, these ideas, I will, uh, will move to discuss explicitly state discrimination problem and process discrimination and parameter estimation. <clears throat> Okay, so quantum measurement. So in quantum mechanics, a quantum measurement is basically any process which allows you to acquire classical information on the state on a quantum, of a quantum system. So this is uh, uh, basically what a quantum measurement uh, is. And now in the, in, the, in the very introduction of any quantum mechanical courses, you learn, for instance, that we do have something like projective measurement. So these are the fundamental tools that we use in order to describe uh, extraction of information from a quantum system. So what is a projective measurement? Ba basically, a projective measurement is a procedure that basically allows you to test whether or not, uh, uh, given a, an initial state of your system psi, uh, if such a state corresponds to one of a possible list of candidates, and typically these candidates are orthogonal uh, vectors, a basis of, of, of your Hilbert space, over which you can expand your, the, uh, the state of Hilbert space. So basically, a projective measurement given psi uh, is testing whether or not this state is one of the element of, 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 of such a basis. And of course, it is uh, the result of the measurement itself is uh, not deterministic in general, but is characterized by some probability, which is given by this expression here, which basically is obtained by taking the projection between psi and j, one of the elements of the basis, and you square it. This is basically the Born's rule. And of course, the, the same notion can be generalized into the case of, in which your initial state is not a pure state, but a mixed state. In that case, this same relation generalized in this form. Now, as an example of a projective measurement, just consider the case in which you, your, uh, your, your, the state of interest, the, the quantum state you are probing, is, uh, is a single photon which has been prepared into possible polarized uh, uh, direction, uh, orthogonal uh, directions. And so, <clears throat> and, uh, and, the, and the projective measurement simply try to determine whether or not this, uh, this single photon that is coming in is uh, either vertically polarized or orthogonally polarized. Then what you do, you put here a polarizing bit splitter and then some uh, photo detector on the, to associated port, if you get a click here, you project this state into the uh, vertical uh, uh, polarization uh, component or otherwise in the orthogonal one, uh, in the horizontal one. And this is a projective measurement. Now, as a matter of fact, this is a very basic notion of measurement, which is very useful, but it doesn't really capture all the possible measurement you can perform on a quantum system. Let's see what we can do uh, beyond projective measurement. So as a matter of fact, in many cases of physical interest, given as the system that you want to probe, typically you don't have direct access to S itself. 
Instead, what you do, you introduce an ancillary system A, which is prepared in some state sigma. Then you couple the system of interest with the ancillary system through some process. And at the end of the process, you measure A. So basically, in this representation, you are using A as a sort of probe that allows you to test the state of the system S. And this is very common. For instance, this is uh, the famous Rutherford experiment, which is a typical experiment of quantum mechanics. So the system of interest here is, uh, is this target here, which is a gold foil, OK? Uh, and then in order to probe the state of, of the target, you shine on it uh, some alpha particle. These are the ancillary system. And then you detect after the two guys have interacted, the state of the alpha particle. So this is indeed a measurement scheme which corresponds exactly to this uh, uh, representation here. And it turns out that if you look at the extraction of information that this process uh, produce on S, this is not describable as a projective measurement on S. Maybe it is a projective measurement on A, but it's not a projective measurement on the system of interest. So this kind of process is a slightly more general uh, than the previous one, the simply direct uh, projective measurement on the system. But this is not the full story yet. Indeed, there are other measurement processes that we would like to characterize which are not projective, which are not of the same kind of the one that we have just seen. So for instance, we have things like noisy detection scheme. What is a noisy detection scheme? Well, basically, again, S is the system you want to probe. But now, this guy is interacting with uh, uh, an external system. I call it A again. But this time, this A system is not a probing system. It's the environment that is interacting with S somehow. And after the interaction, now you perform, let's say, a projective measurement on the system S. OK? So now this time, you still project the state of the system S. But however, you do that after it has interacted with an external environment. And this is the typical scenario of a noisy detection scheme. An example of a noisy detection scheme is given by this representation here. Once more, you have, say, some photon, some uh, field, electron, uh, uh, some mode of the electromagnetic field you want to probe with the photo detector. But unfortunately, not all the photon present, which are present in this, in this mode, reach the detector because they, you lost them because of the interaction with the other mode of the electromagnetic field. And in the hand, what you measure is not S, S itself, but S after the interaction with the environment. Okay? Once more, this, this particular measurement process is not uh, it does not correspond to a direct projective measurement on S. So we need to consider also these possibilities. And finally, there is a third possibility. OK. The third possibility is as follows. Again, you have the system S. And now you have, let's say, a, an ancillary system A. Again, this guy is a probe. No? It's something that you can control. You let the two objects interact. At, and at the end of the interaction, now you measure both. You perform a projective measurement on both. OK? And once more, this process, you can call it a joint detection scheme, is not a projective measurement on S. It's something else. And an example of a joint detection procedure is provided here. Again, this is an optical field you want to, to, to uh, so this one. This one is the opti optical field you want to detect. What you do, you put here a beam splitter. You mix it with the reference uh, mode which is the ancillary system A, okay, which has been prepared, say, in some coherent state. You mix it into a beam splitter, and then you perform photo counting on the two. 
And this is exactly a joint detection scheme. As a matter of fact, this is what in optics is called a homodyne detection scheme, okay? Again, this guy cannot be represented as a direct projection on S. Okay, so it turns out that all these procedures can be uh, explicitly represented in terms of a very powerful uh, um, theoretical tool, which is called the formalism of POVM. POVM is an acronym which stands for Positive Operators and Valued Measures, and uh, basically it allows you to represent both all the, the, the various schemes we have uh, seen so far, the joint detection scheme, the noisy detection scheme, and the indirect detection scheme, as well as the direct projection measurement, uh, as follows. So basically what you do, you represent each one of those uh, uh, possible uh, procedures by assigning to the detection scheme a collection of operators, E of J. These operators are positive semi-definite, okay? So they are emission with positive eigenvalues. And they have to fulfill the property that I wrote here, which is a normalization property. Okay, so each one of these measurements can be described by, formally described by assigning such a collection of operators. And now the probability of getting some outcome, which is labeled by this uh, index J, is obtained by this formula here, which take the place, which replace basically the, raw, uh, the, the Born rule we have seen before. So if rho is the state of your system, you take the trace of the product between rho and ej. And this is, this is it. Now, it turns out that all possible scheme of measurement or detection you can think about can be casted in this form. So there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between measurements and this way of representing them. Yeah. Yes, uh, okay, so, okay. So let's say, let's, let's discuss about um, the case in which you have S, in which you have A, this is the ancilla. Let's say this guy has been initialized in rho. Let's say this guy has been initialized in some state, I call it zero, zero. This is a probe, has been initialized in this, in this kind of uh, situation. And now let's imagine that we couple the two through some unitary transformation U, which typically is gonna be induced by some Hamiltonian, which act interacting Hamiltonian that connect the two guys for some time T, okay? And therefore, before you perform the projective measurement on the ancilla, let's say, the state which initially was this guy here, so this is the input state of the joint system, becomes this object, okay? It becomes this guy here, U dagger U. The two evolves like that. At this point, and let's say this guy is A, okay, and this guy is S, okay. Now at this point, let's say we perform a projective measurement, a pure projective measurement on the ancilla, okay, something like that. And this guy provides us some outcome J, which is labeled by this index here, and let's introduce uh, a, a, the, the projectors that allows you to extract such an information. And uh, so these projectors are associated with a collection of vectors, J of A, okay, with J which goes from one to D of A. D of A is the dimensionality of the probe. If the probe was a qubit, D A is two, otherwise is whatever. Therefore, uh, the probability of getting J, the outcome J from our system S, can now be obtained as, uh, so first of all, I have to compute what is the state of the ancilla after the interaction, because this is a local measurement on A, and the statistics of a projective measurement can be obtained by taking J, A, and here I put rho A prime J, A, where rho A prime 
is just the reduced density matrix of A after the interaction, something like trace of S, U, rho S tensor, zero, zero, A, U dagger, something like this, yeah? Well, let's replace this guy inside, and, and by the way, this object, uh, because this is a partial trace, basically correspond to taking the sum with respect to K from one to DS of K S U rho S tensor zero zero A U dagger K S, where K S are just element of a basis for the system S. Yeah, something like that. And now let's replace this object inside this formula here. And what you get is sum over k from 1 to ds. And then you get something like sum over k s tensor, uh, and then I have j of a, this vector here, rho s tensor 0, 0, a, and then I have J of A tensor K of S, yeah? Well, so now, uh, and here there is a U, of course, otherwise, yeah, there is the U. So now let's, let's uh, apply um, mm, um, so let's, 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 um, Let's move this uh, cat here on, on U and this uh, bra here on U dagger, and then you can rewrite the whole things like sum of a K from one to DS. DS is the dimensionality of the system, of course. It's something like K, S, and then you have J, A, U, A, I, something like that. And then you have row S, and then you have, uh, zero, U dagger, J, A, A, and then you have K, S. And this is just simple, uh, simple, um, this, is our, this is just a simple way of representing the thing. Now, you notice that this is now, so you have a sum of a K here, and K is a basis, so basically this object and, and, and this guy now is, uh, originally U was an operator on S on and A, but now I have contracted the degree of freedom of A, so this guy is just an operator on, uh, on, uh, on the system S, okay? I call this operator uh, M of J, because it, it, it's an, so let's call it M S of J. It's an operator which acts on the Hilbert space of S and depends on this index J. And this guy here is clearly, it's, it's a joint. Yeah, it's just the adjoint of that object. So basic, and also, so now we have an operator on S, rho S, an operator on S, and then we have this uh, KK, and this is just the trace of this operator with respect to the degree of freedom of S. So it's trace over S of uh, M, S, J, rho, S, M, S, J, dagger. is something like that, yeah? And now you use the cyclicity of the trace to move this guy on this other side. M, O, S, of dagger, M, of S, J, rho, S, like that. And now this guy here is E of J. Okay? Okay. So it's, so it's not particularly difficult. I probably lost too much time in order to derive it, but you ask it explicitly. Yeah? So they are certainly positive, semi-definite. You should try to prove that this guy is positive, okay? Prove that this guy is positive. So it's... Uh, the claim is this guy is positive and also satisfy the normalization condition. You should try to prove it. It's not particularly difficult. But anyway, so we do have this formalism. It's very handy. It can be adapted to describe all this situation. Well, 
And now it turns out that in many cases of physical interest, these uh, POVM uh, measurement are kind of more um, powerful than just direct projective measurement on the system itself. Depending on the problem you want to solve, to solve, say you want to extract some kind of information from the system of interest, and uh, you ask what measurement should I choose in order to recover such, such an information, not always uh, the, 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 the measurement which uh, allows you to solve the problem in an efficient way is going to be a projective one. Maybe it's a POVM in one of those guys. OK. So this is uh, a good uh, kind of, uh, 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 this is a nice result, because it means we have more tools at our disposal that possibly are more powerful than, depending on the problem, than just project, projection. OK. Of course, there is also, so th that means that we have more ability in extracting information from a quantum system than we originally suspect. However, you should always remind that when you try to uh, uh, recover information from the system, there are also the limitations. So when you try to recover information from a classical, from a quantum system, there are limitations. Which kind of limitation? Well, of course, there are technological limitations, but these are kind of trivial. Uh, we are not engineer, uh, so for us it doesn't really matter if there are technological limitations. That's not true, but let's say. But there are more fundamental limitations for us, and these have to do with uncertainty relation, for instance. So we know that certain information cannot be recovered while we are probing the system to check other property of the system. Uh, these are has to do with Heisenberg uh, uncertainty in the hand. Not only that, but there are other limitations that quantum mechanics impose to us, and these have to do, for instance, to no cloning. The fact that quantum states are not by themselves observable quantities. If you have a single copy of a system, that's it. You cannot really reconstruct it. So on one side, we have POVM, which are kind of powerful. They extend our ability in order to prove this, uh, a quantum system. On the other side, there are fundamental limitations, which are, again, associated with the fundamental structure of quantum mechanics. And when you try to, uh, and, and the goal of optimization of a measurement has to face this these two kind of problem, the, these two kind of, uh, as to, ma to, to put together these two different competing aspects. Okay, so the fundamental problem in quantum metrology, the, 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 the mother of all problems that you face in quantum metrology is this one, which we have already seen when we were discussing quantum uh, classical communication. So, it's what we, you, can, you may call state discrimination. The state discrimination problem is a problem in which somebody is asking you to determine whether uh, which state is a given one. So somebody is giving you the state row question mark. This is something that we have already seen last time. And you are asked to determine if the state is one of the state row one, row two, row three that, has been, uh, that are possible candidates. And your goal is to find out which one of those possibilities are. And uh, you can try to solve this problem by performing whatever measurement you want. And in particular, you can try to solve this problem by devising uh, the most generic, the most powerful POVM you can think about, not just projective measurement. OK? And so this is uh, a highly non-trivial problem, which is the optimal measurement that allows you to solve efficiently this, this problem here. OK. So as I mentioned, we have seen these kind of, uh, these kind of issues exactly when we were studying communication. OK. So we were, when you study classical communication of a quantum channel, you face this kind of, of problem here, because Alice is preparing quantum state that encode classical messages. Bob received this object and has to check to, to infer what was the state Alice has to, to, to solve. And we have seen that um, uh, there are some figure of merit that you can use in order to characterize this, this kind of efficiency. And um, 
which, uh, and, uh, and, um, and it turns out that the optimal measurement in this particular context are known as pretty good measurements. They were first uh, discovered by, by Olevo, Schumacher, and Goins Moreland, kind of independent way. And these are other two generalizations of this idea, which use sequential decoding and bisection decoding scheme that, I mean, I contributed in, 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 in uh, uh, discovering a few years ago. And basically, the, the, the take home message by, uh, uh, that I want to stress here is the fact that this optimal measurement that allows you to solve the specific problem of quantum communication, of classical quantum communication, uh, rely on optimal strategies, optimal POVM, which are not projective. So the measurement that allows you to reach the bound that achieve the capacity in this uh, special case are, in general, not projective. They are uh, truly uh, non-projective POVMs. OK, so let's move on. So in the, the, the simplest example of a state discrimination problem is this one. So here, you are basically given two alternatives, row one and row two. Let's say with a priori probability 50%, you are given these two possibilities. And now somebody is selecting either row one or row two with probability 50% and is, giving to, is presenting to you such a state, but without telling you exactly what the state is. And the question is, can you guess, can you determine which one of these two possibilities is the state that I've given to you? You can perform measurement, and you have to solve this problem. Now, you can try to solve this kind of uh, problem, identifying the optimal measurement that solve it, but you need to introduce figure of merit in order to classify the values to, 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 to answer the question. And the typical figure of merit that one can consider is what is called the error probability. So the error probability is simply the probability that you give an answer, but it doesn't correspond to the state I gave it to you. So you say one, but I gave you two, or you say two, and I gave you one. You can compute this quantity, and um, this is, of course, a function of the POVM that you have selected, and then you can try to optimize with all possible POVM you can think about. Yeah? And it turns out that this optimization problem was solved by Hellstrom quite a few years ago, and you can show that by optimizing with respect to all possible POVM, you get this minimal error probability, which is expressed here in this very elegant and compact form. It is one minus, and then you have this quantity here, row one minus row two, and this is the trace norm divided by two, divide, and everything else, then you have a factor of two to divide. Now, this object here, the same object here, is indeed the trace distance between row one and row two. I don't know if somebody has introduced the notion of trace distance in previous lecture, but I guess so. So this theorem by Hellstrom is telling you that the minimal error probability that you have when you try to solve a problem of this form is given basically by one minus the trace norm, the trace distance between the two. Now, you may wonder what is the optimal measurement that allows you to achieve this bound. And for this special state, it turns out that the optimal measurement is indeed a projective one. OK? But this is just. Uh, uh, no, I mean, the, 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 the minimal, and the minimal uh, error probability is exactly a function of the trace norm. Then if you introduce different uh, measure of distance, they are not directly related with this one, and so there is not, uh, you, I mean, the formula introduced that guy, okay? So in some sense, you can use this, uh, uh, if you want to see in a different way, you can use this result to give an operational meaning to the trace norm distance, eh? okay? So the trace norm distance characterizes the minimal error probability in the discriminating two state, if you want. That's an, uh, yeah? So if row one is equal to row two, of course this guy nullify, and the error probability, the minimal error probability is one half. So you have fifty percent probability of being wrong, which is like you are just guessing. Okay, 
Yeah, <laughs> if you want. But the point is that uh, I'm asking you to tell me whether the result is one or two, and then I choose. Okay, it's like I put, I, I make a commitment. I say this guy is uh, is one, and this guy is two. Then I'm cheating and giving you exactly the same state, and then I give it to you. Guess whether I choose two or one. But yeah, it's. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm just telling you, I just choose two states and kind of cheating, no? These are two different states. Please tell me whether this state is one or whether this state is two. You don't have. So I put a label on a system on, 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 on the same object, but I put it kind of randomly. So there is no way you can guess where I put my, which label I choose. So it's maximum error probability. Sorry? Yeah. Yeah. OK, so let's move on. So this another result, uh, known result in quantum estimation theory, we can discuss later on if you want. Um, another result that you, uh, interesting result you can, you, uh, uh, well established result in quantum estimation theory is this one. Now, you have the same problem. I give you row one and row two, the two possibility, row one or row two. OK, I'm trying. Uh, you have to guess this label here. And, but now I'm not giving you just a single copy of the system. I give you, say, n copies of it. So you have many, many, many copies. And now this is good, because if you have many, 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 many copies, in principle, you can try to do uh, uh, state tomography. You can try to reconstruct the classical representation of the state. And once you have the classical representation of the state, you know exactly what the state is. Of course, you need, in principle, you need infinitely many copies. But let's say that as the number of copies increase, you expect the minimal error probability to go down. Yeah? And indeed, this is exactly what happens. So of course, the minimal error probability in this case is given by this formula, which is exactly the formula I gave you before, but now is applied to n copies of the two objects, so this object. And it turns out that you can, you take, you can take an asymptotic expansion of this quantity which goes down exponentially, which decreases, decreases exponentially with an, with an exponent which is given by this quantity here. OK, and this is called the quantum Chernoff bound. OK, the quantum Chernoff bound is, uh, is uh, 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 put an upper bound on the exponential decay of this error probability uh, in terms of this awful functional that you see here. But it's uh, a mathematical uh, and uh, analytical result you can obtain. Of course, there are others I cannot cover. OK, so a related problem uh, to quantum uh, 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 to, uh, um, of um, state discrimination is process discrimination. So in process discrimination, the, pro uh, the, 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 the issue is the following. Once more, there are two alternatives, phi1 or phi2. But now these phi1 and phi2 are not states, but processes, like black boxes. I, uh, uh, there are two processes that can act on your system, and you don't know which one is going to act, and you have to guess which one is the process that is going to act on your system. So you have to discriminate between the two alternatives. But now we are talking about quantum evolutions, that is CPT maps. Huh? Remember, all the most generic evolution of a quantum system is a CPT map. You have to d discriminate between phi1 and phi2. I give you this black box and ask you to, to say whether this, is this guy phi1 or is this guy phi2. Now, of course, this kind of uh, uh, wide uh, state uh, process discrimination is relevant. Well, process discrimination is relevant because it's a, it's a problem that occurs in many different uh, uh, contexts. So for instance, when you, uh, um, it has to do with noise detection. So suppose that you have uh, a quantum computer, you have some gate, you have prepared some gates, but, and this is represented by the, this phi2 mapping. But then maybe at some point during the evolution, something goes wrong. And instead of applying phi2, your quantum computer 
is operating on your inputs with phi1, which is the, uh, a, a, a deteriorated version of phi2. It's phi2 plus some error. And of course, it is uh, of interest for us to determine whether this noise has occurred or not. This is exactly what you do when you do quantum error correction. So in the end, uh, process discrimination ha is strongly related with noise detection schemes. Yeah? Another instance where process discrimination occurs is, is, is this one. Okay, so for instance, suppose that you want to probe the presence or the absence of a target. Uh, so this is a kind of military application, so <laughs> unfortunately. So you are trying to detect the presence of, of, of an airplane, let's say, okay? This, is, this one, which is a very realistic and concrete problem, yeah, can be casted in terms of process discrimination because in order to, pr to probe the presence of this airplane, what you do, you shine some probing signal, say some laser beam or whatever, and then depending whether or not you get a reflection from the object, you have to situation. If you get a reflected signal, this corresponds to a transformation of this message, which is due to some map, which is phi1. Phi1 is the process that takes this signal and reflects it. Phi2 instead is the case in which you don't, your signal is not reflected, you get no signal back. So once more, this target uh, discrimination can be casted in terms of process discrimination. You have to decide whether the channel is operating on your system is phi1 or phi2. And this is, again, process discrimination. So how do, you, how do we address the uh, uh, process discrimination problem? Well, we can transform process discrimination into state discrimination. That's very simple. Just put inside the black box a state, and then depending whether or not this, one, this guy is phi1 or phi2, you will obtain at the output two possible states, row one or row two. And now the problem becomes, uh, again, in order to answer the original question, you have to distinguish between two states. And we know how to do because we can just measure them, try to measure it. No? We perform a... Of course, so this is a very nice way of m transforming the previous problem, the state st uh, process discrimination into state discrimination. But of course, there is, uh, there is a caveat, or there is, if you want, there is, uh, there is more, because now you have the possibility of choosing which one initial state of the probe you want. So depending on the choice of this row, you may have more possibility in discriminating row one and row two. So the idea is to find which state is the most sensible, or sensitive, sorry, in, in order to discriminate between these two processes. And so here there is yet another kind of optimization, optimization stage. Not only you have to optimize with respect to the measurement that you need to perform to distinguish the two states, but also you may consider the possibility of optimizing with respect to the input state of the probe, finding the optimal probing state. Yes, there is. Yeah, and it's the next slide. <laughs> okay. So, so now we know that. Uh, um, so. Uh, one thing that you can do, instead of just preparing the state of this probe and sending through the channel, what you can do, you prepare the state of the probe and you entangle with an ancillary system. Okay, so you prepare, say, here a maximally entangled state on, at this level. Then you let this guy to be affected by the noise, by the process, and what you get at the hand is a state in which this guy has been transformed and this guy is not. It's a sort of reference state system that is still correlated with yours, hopefully. And then what you do, you measure both, both, both guys. So you perform a joint measurement on these two objects. And now the problem discriminating between phi1 and phi2 corresponds to discriminating between these two states where 
This is the transform version of the input state row, which now was an entangled state here, according to a local noise, which is phi one, or a local noise, which is phi two. Again, it's a state discrimination procedure, which is now performed over an extended Hilbert space, not just the local one. Yeah? And now, these are, this is very uh, uh, similar, is, is closely, uh, is, 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 is very much similar to what you do when you perform interferometric measurement in order to detect, say, a phase um, delay in an interferometer and you send signals, okay, a probing signal, you mix it with a reference input, you let the two guys interfere, and then you measure. So this kind of process here is very much reminiscent of an interferometric detection scheme, where you have a probe, which is kind of correlated with the reference signal, and then you let the two guys interact, and then you measure, yeah? Now, it turns out that this guy here is the best you can do, but, and uh, as a matter of fact, is strongly related with, uh, with what is called a choi jamulkowski isomorphism, which is, a, I, I didn't introduce it to you in the previous lecture, but it's a correspondence that you can establish between maps and states. So the choi jamulkowski correspondence uh, uh, says that for each process, you can associate a quantum state that fully characterizes such process. And such choi jamulkowski uh, represent, uh, representation of the state is exactly the guy that you get here when you send in through this process a maximally entangled state. So in other words, if you inject here a maximally entangled state of the system and the ancilla, after the interaction of psi, you get a state which contains the full information about the map. So uh, the full information in the sense that whatever the state does is written into the choi jamulkowski state. So in this way, uh, the, the discrimination, the state discrimination of the choi jamulkowski states correspond to a full, complete discrimination of the map. It gives you exactly the, the large, so it characterizes exactly how far away these two guys are. Yeah? So is it, in other words, this is an intrinsic way of discriminating phi. This is exactly what you were asking for. So it doesn't depend on the input. It's something that uh, you don't have to optimize. OK, so as an application of this idea, let's go back to this target problem. and. This, this, this is a protocol that we introduced a few years ago, and we call it quantum illumination. This is indeed the, the, trying to detect the presence of, of a target or, or, the, or the presence of the absence of the target, and you can try to solve this problem by optimizing with respect to all possible input signal you can shine in, okay? And here you just perform, um, uh, uh, say, photo counting, and it turns out that, of course, uh, um, the best way, the, be, the best performances also in this situation here are obtained when you produce an entangled, uh, a, a, an input so, uh, signal which is entangled with a, a reference, and what you do, you just uh, 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 take a joint measurement between the reference state and the transmitted one. And OK, I will not enter into the details, but you can apply this idea for this problem, and you find out that the error probability that you obtain in order to determine the presence or the absence of the, of the target is improved if you use this technique. Yeah? OK, so. Yeah. So let's move on. And now I want to make, uh, in, uh, uh, to discuss a problem which is slightly more complicated than the state discrimination process we have uh, seen before. And this has to do with the parameter estimation. So in parameter estimation, so remember, in state discrimination, the problem is always like that. There is a finite uh, number of possibilities over which you have to choose. 
with respect to we have to choose. So I'm asking you, is this state row one or row two or row three or row, say row n? I give you a finite number of possible answer. And you have to detect which one of these discrete finite number of possibility is uh, realized by the experiment you are performing. In parameter estimation, basically what you do, you extend, you enlarge the number of possible candidates creating a, continu a continuous set of, of possibilities. So now you don't have a finite uh, collection of possibility, but you have a continuous collection of possibility. And this continuous collection of possibilities is basically one parameter family of object. Okay, so it's like it's a collection of state that you can parameterize with the, with the parameter, continuous parameter x. Okay? You, with, you don't label it with a discrete index, but with a continuous one. And now you are asked to determine which one of the state I'm giving you is uh, uh, wh where the state ro, 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 ro question mark is in this family. Okay? In, at which point of this, uh, uh, this family is there. So basically, another way of looking at the problem is, uh, uh, this problem is to say that you have a quantum trajectory in your space of states, which is parameterized by this parameter here, and you have to determine the, the value of the parameter. So that's why it's called parameter estimation. So your, your goal is to estimate the value of that parameter. Now, it's clear that this problem is much more complicated than the previous one because uh, the parameter is continuous, so intrinsically there is going to be always some uncertainty in determining the, the, the specific value of this guy. Okay, in order to, um, to, to, to address this problem, it is better to, to start from uh, the, its classical version. So this problem has a classical analogous uh, that it is worth to consider. So in classical information theory, the same problem goes as follows. Suppose that you have a random parameter x, a continuous parameter, uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a continuous parameter, continuous parameter, and let's say uh, which is encoded somewhere, okay? And now let's say that you probe this black box that encode the value of this random variable x, it's a classical random variable, and let's say that you obtain some stochastic uh, outcome out of your measurement. And these stochastic uh, outcomes are represented by these by this values here, which are also continuous para um, characterized by a continuous parameter. You get C1, C2, and so on and so forth. You perform new, many, many measurements, and you get different value of this, of this parameter. And let's say that these parameters, which are the outcome of your measurement, are related with the x of the black, which is written in the black box through some conditional probability, which is given here, and which fully characterize the measurement process, okay? So I'm just putting by hand all this fact. I don't have a POVM structure here. This is just a statistical connection between two random variables. Well. So now the, the question is the following. Suppose that you have performed some of those measurements, okay, which are, which are this one, and now you may try from these outcomes to infer what is the value of x. So what you do, typically you do data processing. I have a collection of data, I have new points, and I have to infer what was the value of x. So what you do, you create what is called an estimator. So maybe you take the average of this quantity or whatever. You have to process them somehow. And from the processing of, this, of these values, you have to say, what is the value of x? OK. So this is, of course, this object is a, is a function of the vector of outcomes that you obtain. And of course, there are many possibilities. Let's pick one. I don't care. Of course, the statistics of this vector is just given by the product of the, of the uh, uh, probability that each one of the components of the vector is obtained. Uh, this is simply because the value of x is always the same, and we assume that every time we prove the black box, we get the same kind of statistics out of it. Well, and now we want to, of course, 
you have many different possibilities in creating the estimator, and the question is, what is the best estimator? Okay, how can I better infer the value of x from my measurement? So you need a figure of merit to answer this question, and the figure of merit we consider, you may consider, is the root mean square error of the estimation. So what is the uh, root mean square error? It's simply this expression here. You take the, estimating va the, 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 the estimator, but evaluated on the data point you obtain, you subtract it to the real value, you take the square, and then you average. Huh? So this is, uh, of course, if the estimator coincides with x, you get zero, so zero uh, error. Otherwise, you get some value. So, no, this is just a formal way of characterizing the object. And then we are going to put an upper bound, a lower bound on this quantity. So this is very well defined, and you ask yourself how smaller can be this quantity, okay? Now you can, uh, uh, you can, uh, uh, and now the idea is that how small this object can be, it can be. Now it turns out, of course, asking this question is, is, is again a kind of complicated problem, no? Because you have to consider all the possible estimation strategies, okay? But nicely enough, there is a theorem by Kramer and Rao, which is called the Kramer-Rao bound, that says that no matter what you do, the root mean square error is gonna be always greater or equal than this quantity here. So new here, this new here, is the number of measurement you have performed. So you have performed new measurement. And f of x is a function which is called the Fisher information, which is only characterized by the probability, the conditional probability of the measurement outcome and, uh, or, and depend on the random variable that you are trying to compute. Okay, it doesn't depend on the estimation procedure. So it's something which is completely independent from the estimation, from the estimator that you choose. Indeed, it provides a lower bound for all possible estimation strategies. And it's just a function of the um, conditional probability that connect your measurement to the real outcome. So you get so as, as the number of measurements increase, of course, this quantity goes down, it, it nullifies, and it goes down like the square root of, a, of the number of measurements. Yeah. For all possible x, yeah. So you get this identity here. Yeah. And the nice fact about this, uh, this result is that the bound itself is achievable for sufficiently large nu. So there exist optimal estimation strategy that have to do with maximum likelihood procedures that allows you to construct an estimator that indeed scale like that. So this is the best you can hope. You can determine the value of x up to that precision, no more than that. Yeah? But of course, you have to find the optimal estimator. OK, so now let's move on to, let's go back to the quantum case. In the quantum case, there is no black box, or to be more precise, the black box is provided by the state that encode the random variable we want to determine. So you start from this. And now, in order to extract this information, x is a random variable, it's a classical variable, you have to perform measurement, okay? So let's fix a POVM. So you have to fix a POVM. For the moment, let's choose just a generic one. Fix the POVM, you measure the system, and what you get is some classical outcome. Again, C1, C2, and so on and so forth. And now, the probability, a conditional probability that connect the value of x to the outcomes, okay, is just a functional of the POVM that you have selected. And of course, it's a functional also of, of, the, of the state, but that's another problem. Well, once we have that, we are in business, because now we have again transformed the quantum the estimation problem into a classical estimation problem, in which we have to infer x out of this classical data point. Well, 
construct an estimator, and try to minimize with respect to all possible estimators. So in the end, what you can do, you can apply the previous result, the classical result, to determine the minimum value of the uh, root mean square, square uh, uh, root uh, mean um, uh, 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 square error, uh, uh, which is associated with this specific conditional probability. So each one choice of the POVM will, allow, will give you a lower bound associated with the feature information, which is a function of the POVM. And of course, uh, so this is exactly what I said. This is the root mean square error for a given POVM, which is lower bounded by its associated feature information, uh, which is now a classical object. But of course, there is an issue, an issue here. And the issue is, what is the mean, the best value of this quantity you can hope? So find the optimal POVM. Now, the issue is, let's now choose the optimal POVM. And if you try to optimize with respect to all possible POVM, this classical bound gets replaced by this, object, this bound here, which is the quantum Kramer Rau, the quantum version of the Kramer Rau bound. So the, uh, which involve what is called the, uh, uh, the, quant, uh, the, the quantum feature information. The quantum feature information basically is the maximum of all possible feature information optimized with respect to all possible POVM. And so now we have this quantum result. You say that in order to, de to determine the value of the parameter x, in your, which is encoded in your system, the best precision you can achieve is given by this expression here, which again scales like square root of mu, okay? and which is a function of this quantum kramer uh, which is a function of the, of the quantum feature information, which is a function of the, uh, yeah, quantum feature information. Well, yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, for the moment, is is so for me for the moment x x is uh, so let's say this is the space of of quantum state of your system. So this is the set of state of your quantum system, and this is a trajectory inside this state. And this trajectory is rho of x. For the moment, I don't make any assumption. It's just uh, some curve in that space. Let's say it's continuous. Yeah, and you have to determine whether you are here or here or here. I don't care, okay? The full derivation still apply. No, you are looking for the best measurement that allows you to solve this problem. So the promise is the following. The re your state is one of the points along this line, but we don't know which one. So I give you the state and you have, and maybe I give you more copies of this state, you can probe it, and you have to determine whether you are, where you are along this trajectory. Where is the point where the state is along, so there is this uh, prior information which is the state is not here, is not here, is on the line, please find it. And I give you a mathematical representation of the, of the trajectory. So you know exactly what the state are, but you don't know which one specifically is given to you. Uh, new, new copies, you have new copies, so you can perform several measurements. Okay, so let's move on. No, you can even do that, I don't care. So I give you the state, you have your quantum computer, you do whatever you want. So indeed, in order to implement the most generic POVM, typically you need a quantum computer. So you have to introduce an ancilla, couple with the system, perform a joint measurement. You have to perform, say, bell measurement, whatever. So indeed, you will need kind of uh, very sophisticated control in order to implement the most generic POVM. But no matter you, what you do, you are bound to have this kind of uncertainty. You cannot go below that. Yeah, that's uh, a sort of no-go theorem. Uh, it's, uh... Okay, so... Now, of course, as I told you, the quantum feature information uh, is, is rather complicated to, 
and, and computing it is not simple if the trajectory is whatever. But there are some cases in which this quantum feature information is easy to compute. And the most simple example of, of a quantum feature information is, is, is obtained when, for instance, this trajectory that we are considering, that one, is generated by some Hamiltonian. Not necessarily time independent or parameter independent Hamiltonian, but it can also depend explicitly on x. So this is equivalent to the evolution associated with the time dependent Hamiltonian. So let's say that you are evolving according, so your state is evolving according to some procedure, x now is, is the equivalent of a time, which fulfill this uh, dynamical equation here, where h is the generator of the dynamics. So this is a very simple kind of trajectory. Yeah? So said in a different language, I'm saying that I'm considering the situation in which rho of x is given by exponent time ordered. No, sorry, let's write it like that. Like u of x rho of 0 u of x dagger, where u of x is the formal integral of this equation, which is given by the time-ordered exponent of the, of the associated Hamiltonian. Between uh, 0 and x. And the time-ordering uh, comes from the fact that h is explicitly time-dependent. So, yeah, so th let's consider this special case, which is a very legitimate case. If you want an example, let's say that you try to determine the time t at, that has be, over which the system are, are, are evolved according to the Hamiltonian. Okay, so when this is the case, then we can compute the kramer the quantum Fisher information very easily. Yeah? So you can perform this optimization, and it turns out that, um, so as a matter of fact, you get an upper bound for f of 0, which in some cases closes, and the upper bound is this one. So is the uh, variance of the four times the variance of the um, time-dependent Hamiltonian of your system, OK? So you can prove this inequality here, yeah. f0. So if you get an upper bound for f0, you get a lower bound for the minimum uncertainty. So you get this inequality here. And in particular, the gap here close if the Hamiltonian is not time dependent. So if it is just a time independent Hamiltonian, then f0 is exactly the variance of the Hamiltonian. Is that clear? Well? And the variance is just given, no? but you take the Hamiltonian, you subtract the expectation value of the Hamiltonian on the state at that value of the time, and then you take the square, and then you take the expectation value. It's the variance. Yeah, it's the variance. OK, so now a nice uh, um, side effect uh, or of, this, uh, of, of all this is the following. So now we have that the uh, uncertainty is upper bounded by the Kramer Rau, quantum Kramer Rau, which is lower bounded by this object here because of the inequality I've just given to you. Now, if you look at this, uh, this inequality, you can cast it in a very nice way. You can write that delta of x, the uncertainty in determining the value of x, times the uncertainty associated with the Hamiltonian um, is, uh, is uh, larger than 2 square times square root of u. And this is kind of generalized energy time uncertainty relation, because this guy is the uncertainty in the, in the energy content of the system, and delta x is the uncertainty in time. So this is indeed you know, a sort of uh, energy time inequality, the equivalent of the momentum position Heisenberg uncertainty which now has been obtained in the context of quantum state discrimination uh, or, or, or parameter uh, estimation theory. Yeah? Are you happy? Okay. 
Okay, so in other words, uh, the precision in determining the, the value of the time x depend on the spread of the energy of the system. Yeah? And by the way, this inequality here, uh, as I told you, becomes an identity, so these guys are the same if the Hamiltonian is explicitly time independent. And because the, Kramer, the quantum Kramer row bound is achievable, then you, also this inequality is achievable when the Hamiltonian is uh, time independent. Uh, yes, yes, in that sense, yes. <laughs> Fortunately, yes. But still, no, still, it's, uh, yeah. So, yeah. So for a finite number of measurements, it's correct. Okay, so I think, uh, how much time do we have? I, five minutes, that's fine. So I want to discuss a, a final uh, topic, uh, which is associated with this uh, parameter estimation problem. And this has to do between, between, uh, with the difference between shot noise and Eisenberg scaling in parameter estimation. And the subtitle of this section is Entanglement as a Resource. And we know that entanglement is a resource, and we'll see in which sense, in this context, entanglement is also a resource. Yeah? So, okay, so let's consider the following problem. We have a probe. We have a black box that is affecting the probe through some unitary process represented by u of phi, and and the way he, um, and basically the the unitary tr transformation uh, depend on this parameter phi that we want to determine, and let's assume that u is given simply by the exponent of some Hamiltonian time the value of the of the parameter phi. So phi, again, can be seen as a time, as a temporal evolution, okay? And your goal is exactly to determine the value of t, uh, of phi. And you can choose whatever state you want here. You can choose whatever measurement you want there. Let's try to see what's the result of this uh, very simple estimation problem, which is very common in, uh, optic, uh, in, in quantum optics. You typically have to perform this kind of measurement. Is, is equivalent to determine the delay of, of a signal or some uh, of a phase shift or a, or a phase shift. Okay, so yeah, there are several examples. Now, but of course, in order to address this problem, we allow you to probe your black box several times under the promise that. Uh, uh, the black box is the same. So every time you, in, you interrogate the black box, it responds exactly in the same way. So always add the phase phi. So now you can perform several tests and perform several measurements. But of course, you can even try to send entangled resources in through these multiple copies of the black box and then perform joint measurement, okay? So if you wonder how you can do that, because maybe you have a single black box, and you don't have, say, n black box, but just one, how can I do that? How do you do that? If you have a physic, just one copy of the black box, which always re respond to you in the same way. So how can you implement such a scheme? You, you cannot copy the box, huh? the box is just one. So you, basically, you can just send one pulse at the time. Can you entangle pulses that leaves at different times or not? So entanglement is, is something that applies to the present state of, this, of, 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 of reality. No? So I'm entangled. These two guys are entangled now. But what does it mean this guy is entangled with this guy two, two days ago? Doesn't work very well. Yep. Yeah, yeah you, you, you can do that, but it doesn't really um, uh, uh, explain how can you send. Uh, so, so the point is that, yeah, of, okay, use the same box many times, but how do you send an entangled state there? Again, you know, there is a, a, a pulse here, and then there is a pulse I'm going to send in 10 minutes. How can I entangle the two? 
it lives in different space-time point. So the reason, the, the, the answer is, 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 uh, is, is uh, require the use of quantum memories, of course. So the idea is the following. So you have, say, a quantum, two quantum memories. These are just, cub, say, qubits in your computer. OK? You create an entangled state of these two quantum memories now. OK? And now you let this guy, you, you, you move the state of this quantum state of this qubit into some uh, traveling mode, say, some photon that moves away but remaining entangled with that guy. You send it to the box. When it arrives at this stage, instead of measuring it, you charge it into another quantum memory. OK, so this is quantum memory one, this is quantum memory two, this is quantum memory three, and this is quantum memory four. So you, you, you create this guy, you send it through heat, you ch and you, you load it here. And now you have still some kind of entanglement between the two. Now you move this guy into a photon, send it through heat, and then you charge here. And at the end of the day, you can realize this kind of configuration. So when you see this kind of picture, as a matter of fact, they kind of implicitly assume your ability of having memories that can be entangled uh, over which you can kind of uh, process the, 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 the thing, OK? So in other words, I, want to, I wanted to stress this point because I'm not cheating here. In a sense, it is possible, it's difficult, but it's possible. OK? Of course, if you have many copies of the black box, no problem whatsoever. But if it's just one, yeah. OK, so let's move on. And now you can perform the same experiment many, many, many times. Let's say you, every time you prepare n photons, and you send it through heat, and so on and so forth, you repeat the same experiment new time. And the question is, what is the scaling that you get? And it turns out that, of course, you, can, you have different possibility. So for instance, you can decide not to put entanglement between the various boxes to begin with, or you can put entanglement. And also, you can perform local measurement on the black boxes, or you can perform joint measurement, meaning you have to use this machinery here. Now, it turns out that you can prove that if, as long as you don't put entanglement between the various boxes, the scaling with respect to n the number of probes that you say use in a single run of the experiment is going to be like square root of n, which is as a short noise kind of scaling. While on the other hand, if you entangle the probes all together, you, the square root of n becomes an n, 1 over n. And this is called the Heisenberg regime of, of the probing procedure is the number of pulses that you entangle together, OK? And so you pass from the short noise to the Heisenberg regime uh, limit. OK, so uh, unless there are questions, I think I finished my presentation here. And I thank you all for the attention.